The following interview was conducted with Robert E. Santini, Professor Emeritus in Chemistry Department for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, September 20th, 2011 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emerita of Library Science. Good afternoon, Professor Santini. Hello. Thank you. Uh, start, tell us where and when you were born and your parents and early okay. years. Uh, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, June 3rd, 1941. Uh, my mother is, uh, her name was Selma Sloan. Uh, my father was Victor Santini. Um, my mother was born in Pittsburgh and my father was born in rural Pennsylvania, not too far from Pittsburgh. Um, I think my mother was born in 1917 and my father the same year, or about the same age. My father passed away in 1987. My mother is still alive. Uh, she lives in California. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have okay. two siblings. Uh, I have a, uh, I'm the oldest of three sons. Uh, my middle brother is Stephen. He's four years younger than I am. And my youngest brother's name is Richard, and he's six years younger than I am. Tell us a little about grade school and high school, student organizations, and how high school was. Um, I went to grade school in... Uh, up to seventh grade in junior high school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, grade school, I went to A. Leo Wow Elementary School, which was in the uh, Hill District in Pittsburgh, which is an old historic district, which was basically largely redeveloped. Uh, I also went to Whiteman Elementary School, which is in the Squirrel Hill District. Um, I went to uh, seventh grade in Taylor Alderdice High School, again in the Squirrel Hill District. And at that point, my parents moved to Los Angeles. Um, I uh, was in eighth and ninth grade in, um, no, um, that's Edison uh, Junior High School in uh, Los Angeles, uh, South Central Los Angeles. And um, I went ninth, 10th, and 12th grade at Southgate High School. Uh, in Southgate High School, I was um, never a class officer. I was active in uh, science-type clubs, mostly, and uh, that was it. I eventually went to the University of California at Berkeley, uh, graduated there in 1964 with a degree in chemistry, came to Purdue University in 1964. Okay. Tell us a little about campus life. Did you live on campus? Um, here at Purdue? I know at Berkeley when you were undergrad. At so Berkeley? I lived in a co-op at Berkeley uh, for the first two years, my freshman and uh, sophomore year. Um, I met a young woman at Berkeley and we decided to get married at the end of my sophomore year and that we did and then we lived uh, in an apartment uh, junior, senior year and uh, we came to Purdue as a couple. Okay, Was there, uh, mil do you have any military service at all that you serve? I joined Naval ROTC at Berkeley. Um, okay. They had a something called a contract program. I did uh, two years without any reimbursement at Berkeley and two years where they did provide some support and I owed them two years of reserve duty, which I did uh, basically over about a six-year period here at Purdue, okay. uh, basically summer service. Sure. Okay. And then you. So now we move to uh, Purdue. I yeah. Tell about grad school, and then after you finish, you stayed on. Yes. Okay. I uh, came. Okay. To, Go ahead. Okay. I came to Purdue uh, initially planning to be a synthetic inorganic chemist. Uh, uh, but at Berkeley, I had gotten very interested in chemical instrumentation, and I had a heavy background in physics and mathematics. I um, began to hang around, I guess is the way put, to put it, a physics lab that uh, was interested in nuclear magnetic resonance, which at the time was sort of an esoteric technique, was, but was being developed as a structural technique in physics and chemistry. Um, the, uh, the lab was run by a man named Erwin Hahn, uh, who was a um, protege, basically a, a grad student, a post-war grad student of, uh, of Felix Bloch. Bloch won the Nobel Prize in the early 50s for the discovery of the NMR technique. He sh shared it with somebody who was actually a Purdue person at one point, uh, a fellow named Purcell, who eventually went to MIT. And uh, I became good friends with a uh, Hahn graduate student who was a physics TA in some courses I was taking and began to learn about NMR. 
Um, I had an interest in NMR when I came to Purdue and uh, also in another technique related, uh, a technique called EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance. I was also working part-time for a small company. Uh, I had worked my way through college uh, that built NMR and EPR equipment for uh, magnetic field measurement purposes. And uh, so I began to develop a background in this technique um, that was pretty much outside uh, my academic uh, experience, which was, this was not unusual for people at Berkeley, is that you had a good fundamental background and you tended to go your own way, uh, and people would encourage you to do this. But I came to Purdue, and for some reason, the my uh, history preceded me, probably because people, at the faculty at Berkeley knew people here at Purdue. Uh, when I got to Purdue, um, I was asked to uh, report to a uh, facility run by a gentleman named John Amy, which was our little central instrument facility, and they had a brand new modern NMR spectrometer in its day. This was a Varian A60, and uh, John handed me a manual for the thing and just sat, sat me down and said, what do you think of this thing? And I said, well, yeah, this is wonderful. I've heard of them, but I've never seen one. He said, see if you can figure it out. And a day or two later, I was running it. And uh, instead of doing TA ship, I was doing survey NMR spectra for the department. It was a brand new technique. And uh, to me, this was the start of the uh, revolution in uh, physical methods and chemistry. Um, I had been educated in doing analytical work by what we call wet methods. You, if you wanted to know what a compound was, you dissolved it, you decomposed it, you derivatized it, and you sort of, by running chemical reactions, you inferred what you started with. Uh, in an organic molecule that was fairly complicated, you could take weeks or months figuring out what you had. You started off with an elemental analysis. You tried to determine the molecular weight of the compound. You derivatized functional groups, and sooner or later you could do it. And this is how people did chemistry, and this is how people figured out what they had. It was tedious, I would have to say. And it pretty much limited uh, our ability to do chemistry, especially biochemistry. And, but nonetheless, it worked. Um, NMR, infrared spectrum, spectroscopy, and mass spectroscopy were techniques developed by physicists um, at the end of World War II and based on some of the things they learned during World War II that began to be applied towards various things, including chemical analysis. And uh, nobody knew at the time whether you could do these things and do them well or not. And so I walked into a situation where we had one person in the department, his name was Norbert Muller, who was known as Nobby, uh, who was doing NMR spectroscopy. And uh, he was doing some fundamental work. Uh, some of his papers are very widely quoted even now. And um, there was a question as to whether this was a useful technique, and whether it would survive. Um, I began to run survey NMR on this, this instrument that the department had purchased. And I was probably ran some of the first really useful NMR spectra. Uh, it was quite fascinating to see grad students do the classic analytical work where they would derivatize things and then run an NMR spectrum, and I could interpret spectra, and so I would interpret the spectrum and tell them what structure they had, and they would say, aha, uh -huh, that is exactly what we found out from all our classical work. And it wasn't long before the grad students started running the NMR spectra first, and then that would guide their derivatization, and they would use the classic methods to confirm the NMR spectra. Uh, faculty, being a little more conservative, they would uh, always demand both methods. But as time went on, uh, when structure after structure was confirmed, I would say it took maybe three or four years. But uh, it got to be the point where people would run the NMR spectrum, they would run a mass spectrum, which among other things would often confirm the molecular weight. They would typically do an elemental analysis and uh, infrared spectroscopy was coming along too, and people began to de develop uh, libraries of, of compounds that were called fingerprint 
compounds, uh, it got so uh, grad students could use those methods alone to tell what a structure was. And faculty began to embrace this when they discovered what the productivity would do. I mean, really, instead of taking weeks or months, you could often characterize a compound in a couple of days. And uh, bit by bit, people adopted these methods. And then the pressure became make them better, make them more reliable. Well, I had a, a knack for doing instrumental work, for making them run, for making them run better. And the group I belonged to um, was interested in the EPR technique. Well, they got an EPR spectrometer and I began to do instrument development in EPR and I found that I was doing the instrument development on everybody's project and I wasn't getting very far on my own. So I realized that, that I was a born instrument developer and uh, John Amy, who ran this facility, was a tremendous mentor to me in this sense that he encouraged me to stay with this. Uh, he really helped me find my true calling, I think, is the way to put it. And um, the opportunity came for me to switch to another PI, a fellow named Harry Pardue, uh, who, I, who was really interested in pushing the state of art and this sort of thing. Was, did he, was he the head at that time or not? He was the head at that um, time? No, he wasn't. Okay. Harry okay. Pardue was uh, one of the younger people in the analytical oh, okay. division. The heart and soul of the analytical division was a guy named Lockhart B. Rogers, known as Buck to everybody. He loved that Working nickname. And he was in separations. The other big thing was happening in chemistry at that time was gas chromatography and liquid chromatography was developing. And when you have, hear people talk about hyphenated methods, they're talking about linking a separations technique to one of these analytical techniques so you can take a mixture of compounds, separate them on the fly, and then individually, quickly, isolate each component. And so LC mass spec or GC mass spec right. or LC NMR or something like that are very well established techniques that we were just learning to manage mm -hmm. then. And it took years to develop these as high speed techniques long time, a lot of work. Uh, Harry was interested in optical spectroscopy and I worked with him in that area as did most of his students and he was interested in very high precision optical spectroscopy. Um, I worked on chemiluminescent compounds which turn out to have their utility but in some ways they're a bit of a dead end. Uh, after I got a PhD I had a sort of a inspiration, and this probably should have been my graduate work, but I call it my postdoc work. Um, at any rate, um, I, John Amy was aware that I, well, what I was doing and what I could do, and one day he came up to me just as I was getting my, finishing my thesis work, and he said, how do you like living in Lafayette and West Lafayette? I said, I like it. My wife loves it. By then she was working for Purdue and she'd gone back to school and she became a mathematical statistician. Her mentor was a gentleman named Wyman Nyquist in agronomy and he brought her along to be his equal, in my opinion. And uh, she took over a lot of his work and she actually finished many of his projects when he went in decline and passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, and she did that very lovingly. She was happy to do that. He was quite a guy. At any rate, um, I didn't think too much of it at the time, and the next thing I know, I had an offer from the department to work for, in John Amy's group, and I did, and eventually I actually took over John Amy's yeah, position and ran that facility. A uh, question I have, how did the lab, because when you said, when you came, they were just starting this instrumentation facility. Uh, I think of the researchers, had there been some thought about having such a, a facility? Yes. Okay. Um, what happened was, you have to get in, go back. Chemistry began to evolve from a wet science okay. to this physically oriented science. And that meant instrumentation. And there was a period from, I'm going to call 1950 to probably into the 70s, where every new technique was so revolutionary that the manufacturers couldn't keep up. 
And when they did deliver equipment, it was very shaky. And the department recognized that they needed support in this area. Um, they With had instrumentation yeah, support. Yeah, okay. uh, and uh, we discovered, and probably the guy that recognized this was a gentleman named M.G. Mellon, who I don't remember whether the guy Mellon was ever head of the department, but he was certainly head of the analytical division, and he put in place many of the uh, of the things that made the analytical division the overwhelmingly high ranked division it is. And one of them was they realized that it was better to train chemists to be instrument engineers as well as good chemists and eventually computer specialists and software people than it was to try to take engineers and try to teach them to be chemists. Now you would think that that would work either way but there is something about people having a knack for chemistry and the basic research that works one way but not the other. Okay. And uh, I was one of the people that had the knack both ways. And they were always on the lookout for people like that. And John would fold them into his group. And I think that that's one of the reasons the analytical division has always been so right. successful. Okay. Okay. And they recognize that. And so we've always had this strength in being able to build new devices, especially when we had ideas about what could be done. And I might add we're still doing that. I may be retired, but I'm still working with Scott McClucky's group as a visiting scholar. And I came over today after working this morning on something called a Zeifman trap. It's a special kind of an ion trap, and we want to use it to do some experiments that have never been done before. Uh, and it's a device the physicists use to handle subatomic particles, but we seem some ways to do it with proteins which the physicists aren't particularly interested in, but we think has great potential for chemical analysis and for what we now call proteomics and so on. And we just got a Zeifman trap working and trapping chemical ions. And the guy I'm working with who's a postdoc is sitting there probably as we speak playing with okay. it. And so this whole idea that chemists should be doing instrumentation and that they should be leading the state of the art rather than waiting for someone else to do it has gone back a long ways. Now Guy Mellon probably started doing that with spectrophotometers in the early 20s. And uh, it just really is something that that whole department is accepted as something we need to do. And that facility has done it. And I can go through a whole host of areas from basic instrumentation to environmental science. Where we have done it, we've probably done groundbreaking work, and as a result, we've led the world. In my specialty area, NMR, there's no question that there have been periods where we've told the whole world how to actually do these experiments first. Um, any a uh, couple comments on your specific research? You sort of covered some of that. Yeah. When you, uh, well, in NMR, um, NMR started off with, with a very slow scan technique, and it's been regarded as very low sensitivity, and it would take you between minutes and hours to get spectra. And where NMR is very interesting when you do it with small molecules, but where it gets truly interesting is the most sensitive atom you can do NMR on is proton. Uh, there are three types of protons. There's three isotopes, and we the normal isotope, hydrogen, is the one we usually do. Mm -hmm. You can actually do tritium, but that's a radioactive isotope, and so you want to do that carefully, and it's not often done. Uh, deuterium is, uh, it can be done, but we use that as what's called a lock solvent to stabilize the NMR. Uh, what's really interesting is to be able to do the biologically interesting nuclei, and that's nitrogen-15, carbon-13, phosphorus-31, to some extent oxygen. Uh, and But carbon-13 was the first one people tried to handle. Now, the problem there is that's a stable isotope. It's not radioactive, mm -hmm. but it's only there in 1% abundance, natural abundance, and it's, it resonates at a frequency in a magnetic field such that it also has a sensitivity disadvantage compared to proton. And so you really have to 
raise the overall sensitivity experiment in any way you know how. And then you have to signal average, run the experiment again and again and again to see a signal. Um, we were among the very first people in the world to be able to run carbon-13 on a routine basis, first on small molecules and then on larger molecules. I work with a gentleman named John Markley who was at Purdue from the very early 70s to 1986 and we ran an NSF regional center for that uh, kind of work and we ran carbon-13 nitrogen-15, phosphorus was easy for us to do. Uh, we also did uh, fluorine-19 NMR. Uh, and we did a lot of biologically oriented work, including work on infused organs and occasionally some live animals. And we took NMR from a esoteric technique to something that could really be useful to people who are doing biological work. Now, the whole world was moving in this direction. Um, a technique called Fourier transform NMR was proposed by a gentleman named Richard Ernst. He was a physicist. He worked at the Swiss Federal University. They call it a technical high school, but they don't mean a high school the way we do. They mean something very special. Uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1992 for that work alone, if I remember rightly. And, um, he proposed this in a paper in 1967, and uh, the field had to work on that very, very hard to make the theory work. But it was a beautiful paper because it basically predicted a great deal of almost everything about the technique in this one paper. He later uh, predicted a technique called multidimensional NMR, although I've been told that a man named Genier first proposed this in a conference then the, you see this in a program, but it was never published anyplace else. Uh, Genier uh, was never recognized in that way. Uh, the same technique mutated into um, NMR imaging, MRI. I was at the conference where a gentleman named Lauterberg, whom I know by way of Navi Muller, uh, got up at a meeting. He wasn't at a pro and the uh, experimental MR conference and announced to the group that he had something important to uh, present, although he wasn't on the program. And I would have gone for coffee and donuts, except that Nobby Muller had been in the Army with Lauterberg, and they had both been working on NMR techniques for the Army. And uh, Muller once said to me, if Paul Lauterberg ever says he has something important to discuss, you really ought to stay and listen, because he's a very <laughs> smart guy. Well, he said this, and I decided I would forego coffee and donuts to hear what he had to say. And he described his first crude imaging experiment. And then he said at the end of this, and I will be back next year, I think, with a cross-section of a mouse. This is 1972. And I thought at the time that if he does that, I know where this is headed. Uh, it took the doctors until about 1985 to recognize what was going on. And I suspect, in part, it was because a chemist did it. Now, Lauterberg and Mansfield were awarded a Nobel Prize for that in 1999, I believe it was. Um, there have been several Nobels associated with NMR. Uh, there was one by, awarded to Kurt Vutrich uh, involving protein analysis by multidimensional NMR, and Vutrich was on his campus a couple of times. Uh, I knew him when he was a postdoc at Berkeley, mm -hmm. just briefly. And so the NMR community for yeah, a while really was got, very small. Got your hand in there. That's right. uh, at any rate, um, I could go for hours, and somebody has to write a comprehensive history of the development of NMR because it is an extremely interesting story. Uh, we have another man on campus involved with NMR, a man named Overhauser in physics. He's got to be about 90 by now, but he developed something, he uh, discovered something called the Overhauser enhancement mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. Overhauser effect. Right. It's fundamental to doing some kinds of NMR experiments and why he hasn't been awarded a Nobel, I have no idea. But we, uh, between Purcell, Overhauser, some of the other people, Markley, um, Purdue has had uh, has been intimately involved with the development of NMR, and uh, I've been sort of a spear carrier. I've been an observer to that. Um, been my, with it. Right. my approach 
has been that if somebody can tell me what they want, I'll try to make the instrumentation do it. Uh, we were among the first to do a lot of things. And I look not back at it now, and there's peop there are things that are people are doing routinely that we did very early in the game, uh, and with a great deal of difficulty that now they just toss it off. The, could you tell us what your, when you became the director, were, were the, what were the cha responsibilities or challenges of that? Um, just tell about uh, that. Well, first of all, the department, in order to have a facility like this, the department basically gives up the option to have probably one full professor and a group. And uh, this obviously costs the department money. Deans always look at the cost of a facility like that, and they figure, well, you know, if we eliminate that budget item, we can hire somebody else, we'll or we can save money. Somehow, huh? uh, and uh, this is kind of like the goose that lays the golden eggs. Um, it's very, you have to fight for your existence all the time. Now, were you, when Amy was the head, you were affiliated with the facility. Yes. Right? Okay. So I have been along. with the facility the whole time. Okay. And John's firm belief was that you do not operate that facility on a recharge basis. And the reason you do it like this is that probably our biggest value to the department is to have somebody to come in, faculty, grad student, whatever, and ask a question. Like, I need some consultation. I don't know about all these things, and I need some consultation. How do I get something done? I may want you to do it for me, design it. I may want to work with you. I may want to do it myself. And you know, there's just a just an sure. incredible range of degrees of cooperation. But that important thing is somebody has to come in to con and to start consult. discussing. Right. Yeah. And if you put a clock and a fee on that consultation there's a real inhibition to come in and discuss. We have a machine shop attached to the facility, and so we charge for the machine shop time because the, because the university demands we do it. But we have consulting hours that we don't charge for because it's very, very important that a grad student understand how to select materials, how to design something, so it can be put together and taken apart and reproduced. He needs assistance. And well, they, they and need to talking, be education. Right, and in talking to, an ex, to a, a key person. Yeah, and um, a, an example is a, somebody with a very strong physics background doesn't understand stacking tolerances. They want everything to be to the nearest micron, a perfect plane, a perfect circle, a perfect sphere. And when I mean everything, they want to build the whole apparatus and it's all like that. You can't build anything mechanical. Well, you could, but it's going to be prohibitively expensive and take a long time. The machinist has to be able to say, well, you can have this one plane where everything is like this. And then as we stack tolerances, things will get less exact the further we go from that plane. If you want to talk about surface finish, you can have something very precise on the surface finish, but it will take a long time, and we will have right. to work very hard. What some people want when they talk about surface finish is they want something shiny. In other words, they want it to look like chrome on a car. But shiny doesn't mean necessarily high-quality surface finish. Right. When we talk about surface finish, we talk about deviations from a plane, maybe. And that doesn't often look shiny. It looks carefully ground. And uh, we find many people want it to be shiny or have a certain texture or a patina or something. And they don't understand precision versus, you know, uh, well, the look of this thing. Right, I understand. And uh, this, the, the, the case on that recorder. And that may be very precise because it's from a precise mold, but it may not because it's molded from plastic that often doesn't hold tolerances as it cools on the mm -hmm. mold. Um, same thing with electronics. Um, people want lots of things to be optimized. Sometimes you take a look at a device and you can't optimize everything simultaneously. And that is an extremely important lesson to know. 
And if you put a charge on learning that, then it's not going to happen. So we've had to fight a battle to keep recharges away from that educational function. Now, sure, we have to buy parts. Yeah. Uh, sure, we have to have modern, up-to-date equipment and so on. Now, in the current climate, the present director, a fellow named Mike Everly, he's fighting this battle with the dean right now because the dean doesn't really see the value of that facility without recharges. And um, the only thing I can say is that if they turn it into a recharge facility, it's going to be a different kind of facility. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that over 40 or 50 years, the way the facility is run has been absolutely crucial to the success of the analytical and physical divisions and probably other divisions in that department. And there's no question that it has enabled people to stay ahead of the state of the art. Mm -hmm. Now, other schools come and study the way we do this, and they absolutely envy what we do. Now, they want to do it. They say, well, well, let's say we want to do this next year, and it would be a tremendous investment to start that up over a couple of years. We did it over many, many years. Right, yeah, right. Uh, and I would say that's the biggest challenge. Okay. Then finding really good people that can work, that can do engineering work in the open-ended research environment where you make two steps forward and one back. Right. You know, that you try something. And you have to take, when you buy into a project, you have to see it through. Um, I worked with one engineer years ago where he would work on a project and research has this quality. We could be pursuing a goal and you could do an experiment one night and discover that the goal you were after is just not going to work. And some people just can't deal with that. But I've never seen a situation where you don't recover 90% of whatever you do and take a little different path to something else that might even be better. And, I, and that abrupt 90 degree turn, so to speak, toward a different goal is very difficult for some people to deal with. And so finding people that can work in that facility and deal with these changes in path and not quite knowing where you're going has been a real challenge. That's a big one, that's right. Um, you got a couple of lectureships, which were kind of nice, and then also mm -hmm. the, when uh, the researchers, can you tell us the NIH member on the special study sections, what that involved? Well, you get proposals. Okay. Um, some of them are pure research proposals. Do they uh, come to you here, or did you have to go to Washington? Oh, I went to Washington. I've sat on study sections just like anybody else. Okay. And I've had everything from R01s to SBIR proposals. And um, I've been also been an outside reviewer where they study sections deadlock on something fairly controversial, and, and the reviewers uh, don't know what to do, and so they'll send it to an outside reviewer. And um, I just sort of looked at them and sort of tried to give my best view sure. of what's going on. Um, I look at a proposal, and if somebody's trying to make a reasonable attempt to do something new, uh, and the physics and the chemistry seems to be there, I'm inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt. Probably the most interesting reviews I've done is uh, NSF's had a program where they were looking at small schools in areas that were traditionally not getting a lot of funding, uh, in southern states typically. And they were doing campus. These academic? Yeah. Okay. Uh, campus visits, and they wanted to establish better departments, science departments in chemistry and physics. And I was on some site visits to those places and discovered that they had dedicated faculty, dedicated academic administrators, and they actually had uh, pretty darn good science departments and with a little bit of money they could probably be first rate and uh, give them a boost. just give them a boost and uh, the idea was give them enough don't give them a little bit of money give them enough money to really either make it or fail you know let's just do the experiment you know and i particularly was impressed by going to mississippi state uh i just could not believe the enthusiasm and the out-and-out 
competence of their faculty and their administration. I think that, that money spent on that campus was money well spent. And I just came away from there feeling that nobody was pulling a sales job, that these folks would take what they were given, whatever it was, and they would use it well, and that they would turn out decent students, that they would produce a very good chemistry department, that they would produce students at all levels that would go out and do well. And looking back on that, now this has got to be 20, 25 years ago, I see the effect of that, that you know, That's positive nice. effect. Now, some of that money probably got wasted on some yeah, campuses, right. but uh, yeah. I was just impressed on that visit, and I've kind of kept track of that campus ever since. And it's just very interesting to watch young people's careers develop and these people do right, well yeah. after that. And but that's the review yeah, that the I NSF, truly liked. The NSF, that Division of Polar Programs, the advisory. I think um, researchers would be interested in your comment on that. At the time, the polar programs were going through a major evolution. And I'm not so sure they're finished yet. Um, in 90 and 91, polar programs were largely geology up to about 1990. And something really interesting happened. They discovered these frozen, these lakes under the ice in Antarctica. And those lakes were thought to be dead. But in fact, they're very oxygen rich and there's a whole ecology there. And so the geologists didn't know what to do with it. And so they got some biology people down there. And the biology people wanted the kind of things that we have in Lilly and in chemistry and wherever. And then they wanted, infrareds, UV visible spectrometers, and NMRs, and mass specs. And the question came up, can you do this stuff in McBurno Base and on icebreakers or what have you? Well, icebreakers were pushing it, I think. But McBurno Base had everything they needed. They had power, the floors were stable, they had technicians that could they fix things. There, yeah. And so the question is, well, okay, uh, if you have spare parts and if you're going to run superconducting magnets for NMRs, if you have the cryogen storage, the, basically the lift capacity to get things down there, yeah, you can run that. And uh, that was an interesting session because there were the geologists that were sort of trying to protect their turf. Uh, and you had these biologists that wanted to ramp up a different kind of programs. And there was very definitely a, a competition for funds and lab space and so on. Now, there was a problem rearing its head then that you can pick up a copy of Science Now and see. The NSF was contracting for the use of three icebreakers from the Coast Guard. And those icebreakers dated from basically World War II. They're getting old. Well, right now, uh, they were high maintenance items then, and right now, two of them, I think, are in mothballs, and one's in a shipyard, and they, for a while, were uh, contracting with Denmark for a very capable icebreaker, and the Danes now have another use for it, and now they're contracting with the Russians. Uh, they have a real problem with, with supplying McMurdo Base because the icebreaker capacity, they get in there, is, is an issue. Uh, we support our North Polar programs with Canadian icebreakers to a great extent. Now the Canadians have a political reason for doing that. And so we're probably okay. But uh, we may be supporting South Polar programs with a Korean icebreaker and it just gives you some idea where the cost constraints are beginning to hit research. Now, Antarctic research is truly very, very interesting. It has, you know, you can talk about global warming, but a lot of the evidence for global warming or climate change one way or another is coming out of Antarctica. I mean, really, in evidence is hard to argue with that is going to really settle the issue is coming from Antarctica. I've also worked on North Polar programs with a gentleman named Shepson here from our department. He's in chemistry and in a and EAS. And um, North Polar programs have a problem: is there's no continent on the north. I mean, there are continents. And I've been to Point Barrow recently and helped put some buoys out in the uh, North Arctic Ocean, helped design them, 
And the North Arctic is very difficult to work with, very much different from uh, the Antarctic. And I think that there's good science to be done, but the Antarctic has a continent, it has ice shelves that drop things off into the ocean, and so the long-term geology is going to tell us a story that we may or may not get from uh, our North Arctic programs. And I think it's a shame that we have to argue about where we're going to get the icebreakers. But I was there in those programs. I wrote a pretty extensive report that you could do life sciences at McMurdo Base, that you could run instrumentation, that there was no reason you couldn't run centrifuges in the lab, bi the sort of lab instruments that biologists would use. And I'm, I believe it had some real influence. I'm sure. So, mm -hmm. uh, is that a U.S. that McMurdo is that U.S. Yeah, that's a U.S. base. And the, okay. Uh, there are a whole series of bases. The Russians have a base. The uh -huh, British have a right. base. But that's the one that's been around for a long the, time. Uh, the Argentinians and the Chil Chileans have bases. A lot of these are there for political reasons. They're, in theory, people don't have territorial claims on Antarctica. In practice, they're all keeping their hand in. Uh, it, you know, nations have interests, and that's sure. the way it is. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you if it's going to, if we could do, I've got some more things that I'll ask you, but I'll try to limit to about an hour, and sure. we could do a part two. Would that mm -hmm. be good? Yeah. Okay. I'd be happy and to. I hope I haven't digressed No, no, too no. Far. I'm 